Hello and welcome to the Indian Writers Forum. In this latest edition of the series of interviews that we call Writers Talk Politics. So even though we generally do this series of interviews with writers, we would say that uh, today we are really pleased to have with us uh, a philosopher who will also be discussing one of uh, the greatest philosophers that we have produced from the subcontinent, uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. We are very pleased to have with us Professor Shomar Brother Chaudhary. Thank you so much for your very, time. Very, very nice to be here. Very pleased to be here. Uh, as uh, to give our viewers a little introduction, we'll be discussing this particular book. It's called Ambedkar and Other Immortals, an Untouchable Research Program, the full, length, uh, the full name of the book. It's brought out by uh, Navayana. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought we could begin by talking a little bit about what you call uh, Ambedkar, the historical immortal, which your words. Now, uh, a running theme throughout the book seemed to be the exceptionality of Ambedkarite thought, which is not just in terms of greatness, but also in terms of an exception to, say, the prevailing order of thought, whether in his time or in our time. So would you say that's a fair assessment and a theme in your Yes, opinion? absolutely. That's a fair assessment insofar as exception is not a historical. Exceptions are part of history, but they also form that strata of history which, in a sense, is not assimilated or is not appropriated by the dominant forces of history. To that extent, exception also stands for a certain resistance to the dominant uh, modes of thinking in history. And yes, by that measure, Ambedkar was a thinker of, an exceptional thinker, but also a thinker of resistance. So yes, that's a fair assessment. Um, some of the uh, very specific points about the book, and so I'll, I'll pull out a couple of sentences from some of the chapters. Sure. Uh, you say that the Ambedkarite method is to divide the natural consensus that there exists such a national social totality called India. So what is it that, that, that you mean by dividing the natural consensus? Yeah, I mean, natural consensus is only an appearance of being natural. Natural consensus does not mean that it is a fact of nature, a law of nature, that there's something like a nation which has a society immemorially embedded in it, which we call Indian society or the Indian nation. That the Indian nation uh, is a historical reality with all the inherent contradictions and historically uh, formed contestations that go into the formation of the nation over a long period of time. How that history is to be understood or periodized is another matter, but that it is a contested and uh, uh, m uh, heterogeneously formed reality is something that uh, is uh, definitely a, a challenge to any idea that uh, there was and always has been and always will be uh, uh, an India or if you want a Bharat, uh, a kind of Bharat as some people are fond of saying. Uh, that there is any such reality is actually uh, uh, a completely erroneous and mistaken historical notion. And um, for that reason, mm, I speak of uh, division of this kind of a consensus, which is of course produced as if it is a law of nature, as if it is a fact of nature, as if India is a natural reality rather than a historical reality. Which means that for even for this natu so-called natural consensus, there is actually a whole machinery, an ideological machinery that uh, is used to produce this sort of a natural consensus, which then is specifically, again historically, divided by certain thoughts of resistance, certain thoughts which question that consensus. And they don't question it merely for academic reasons or merely scholastic reasons. They question it because in that natural consensus, there are always certain sections, certain strata, certain people who are excluded from that consensus or their their voice is not heard in that consensus, they're di divisionary. Divisive is the word I've used in the book, though it is, I understand, a perilous word. It can be misunderstood easily. So you can substitute or use divisionary, which is a somewhat convoluted term, but whatever. Divisionary or divisive reality of this consensus, which means those who are on the other side of the, on that side of the division, uh, who are actually put down or, or suppressed whose voices are um, excluded. So from that side, uh, the division has to be exposed, mm -hmm. um, which of course then endangers the consensus and shows it to be a historical production. 
uh, as as you're saying this uh, this this challenge to the consensus that you mean there's of course now in contemporary india the challenge is very much there but i was actually very interested in your uh, reading of uh, the consensus that uh, ambedkar broke at the time of yes. the creation of the nation so could Absolutely. you speak a little bit about Absolutely. some of the uh, consensus is with respect to gandhi and other yes. national figures yes. and, and yes. ambedkar who stands right. outside of it right that. right absolutely so there are two fronts on which ambedkar is fighting uh, the uh, one obvious front is the national movement as not as a movement but as a movement apparently based on this very natural consensus that there is a nation which is the subject of this movement mm -hmm. as a seamless unified reality or totality uh, this ambedkar questions on the very grounds of caste that caste is something which uh, both forms and deforms the nation or the idea of the nation which is supposed to be the subject of the national movement in so far as it is a movement towards the freedom of the nation so ambedkar differentiates between freedom and merely transfer of power mm -hmm. and he does that till the very end i mean till formal independence is got uh, so that's one front on which ambedkar um, carries out his um, his struggle against this national consensus which is a natural which is produced on the grounds of being a natural consensus by the very movement which in itself is not entirely a, a, neg a, a negligible movement at all it is after all a very powerful movement the national movement of which the figure who is again not to be neglected is gandhi mm -hmm. um so Gan ambedkar never neglects gandhi mm -hmm. on the contrary he actually takes gandhi very seriously but he takes gandhi very seriously against this very gandhian technology of producing that consensus mm -hmm. so in that sense he is always at pains to demystify gandhi but as somebody whose so called mystery is a very powerful force in the course of the national movement Uh, so that's one front, and I have in my book um, tried in some chapters to read Ambedkar's modes of demystification, particularly um, the chapter which is a reading of Ambedkar's essay, uh, the chapter Ambedkar's own chapter called Gandhism in his 1945 book. Uh, what Congress and Gandhi do to the untouchables? Yes, did to the untouchables. So, so, um, so that's the f first front. The second front is, of course, the colonial. the colonial consensus which is also interestingly a kind of oriental consensus that there was once a great nation mm -hmm. there was once an immemorial nation but that nation somehow fell from grace during a certain history which as if the colonial intervention is meant to correct through this return of a kind of oriental vision mm -hmm. of a great civilization peculiarly though not so peculiarly actually because the 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 logic is becoming increasingly clearer in our day uh, the hindu mahasabha uh, pretty much went along the same lines as the oriental <coughs> logic of this um, again the consensus on an indian an an an, an immemorial indian idea the idea of india so on both these fronts ambedkar carried out um, a relentless questioning and um being a, a dissent a dissenting voice um on the, on the second front of course the oriental and equally um, communal mm -hmm. idea of an indian civilization um was something ambedkar again questioned on the grounds of uh, caste of course the the very stratified and unequal nature of caste society but also on the in his great books on the sh the book on the shudra on the untouchables on the very historical and also speculative hypothesis that uh, the people who actually pretend to be the natural indians the the ones who are always indians and the so called monopolists of the indian idea uh, uh, could very well have been a a, colo a colonizing people the Br the brahmanical people could be a colonizing people to that extent the people who brought in brute conquering imperial power to to a society which um, had um, a different indigenous composition i mean he in this sense he also carries on pulley's um, yeah. dismantling of the idea of anything like uh, a natural brahmanical indian um, indian social constitution mm 
So in, in, in a sense, the, the interesting thing is that even Brahminism is a kind of constitution, is a perverse constitution, but it is a constitution insofar as all constitutions are historical. They're constituted, forms are created, and then they are deployed as if they were always there with a kind of retrospective effect right. that they were always like that. So India was always the land of the, the Varnas and the divisions mm -hmm. of Varnas. Ambedkar questioned this and wrote very, very sharp scholarly refutations mm -hmm. of this Brahmanical ideological mystification on radical hypotheses which are different about the indigenous history of India.